Well, good morning, Orchard Church. My name's Dennis. I'm glad to be with you again this morning. I'd, I'd like to uh, begin our time. I, I look out uh, at the uh, assembly this morning and realize that there are some who are a little bit older than others. Won't mention any names in particular, but uh, uh, as I was preparing, it kind of dawned on me that there are some of us who have lived through some pretty epic times that really have changed the way the world works. Uh, for those of us who are a bit older, the 1980s, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union changed the world in, in an incredible way, uh, the, the late 1980s. Um, uh, one of the things that dramatically changed the world was the uh, public use of the World Wide Web started 1993. I would have thought it started a long time before that, but 1993, who, we could, who could live without Siri nowadays? So, so some of these things just are crazy. You know, uh, for us in America, 9-11 in 2001 changed the way the world traveled and the whole idea of, of safety and defense. And um, When do you think the first iPhone was introduced? 2007. You would have thought that that would have happened a long time ago because who can function without an Android or an iPhone nowadays? So there are some things that dramatically change the way the world works. I mean, not to mention the pandemic uh, in, in 2020 and beyond. And, and now we've got artificial intelligence to deal with. So there, there are things that are so powerful as events, they dramatically impact the way the world works. And the reason why I thought of that during my preparation is because our text is going to talk about a series of events in the first century that impacted every human being who ever lived. Now, what events were those? Well, let's find out together. So if you brought a Bible with you, Open, please, John chapter 16. Uh, you can find it on your phone, you can find it on your tablet, or page 877 in that pew Bible right in front of you will bring you to our text. I think it's really important that you have the Bible with you while we're going through it. I think it will really, really help. John chapter 16. We're going to learn about the ultimate game changer. Here's the historic context. Uh, the, the words that we're about to read in chapter 16 are part of an extended teaching Jesus gave to his disciples when they gathered together to celebrate their last Passover meal. They met in, a, in an upstairs apartment, and because of that, chapters 13 through 16 in the Gospel of John is often called the Upper Room Discourse. Well, that's what we're seeing draw to a close. We know that after the celebration of the, of the Lord's table, the, the, the Passover meal, if you will, that Jesus and the 11, because Judas had, had left already, uh, Jesus and the 11 left that upstairs apartment and they started walking towards the Garden of Gethsemane where he would be arrested. Along the way, he kept teaching them and our text is going to be what some of those teachings are really all about as he kind of brought it all to a conclusion. Now, uh, he had taught them about heaven. He had taught them about the Holy Spirit. He had taught them about coming persecution. He had told them a number of times, I'm going to die, but I'll rise again from the dead. The problem was they didn't understand it. And Pastor Assad spoke about it. They were kind of living, and he described it as living in denial. Because they just didn't know. They just couldn't comprehend what this was all about. And so as they walked towards Gethsemane, the last recorded words we have to his, his guys here in, in this teaching are all about comforting their broken hearts because they heard that he was going to die, and it just overwhelmed them. So in that context, his words were meant to bring peace to them. And that's how he summarizes everything. See it with me, John chapter 16 and verse 33. We're going to really focus in on this verse here. 
Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, verse 33, so that in me you may have peace. Their hearts were in turmoil. They were grieving. They're hurting. They're sorrowful. Jesus says, I want you to have peace. Verse 33, in the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have, what's the word? Overcome the world. So he says to him, listen, guys, following me is going to be a different, difficult path. Because the people in the world who don't believe in me, they're not going to like you. And as a result, you're going to experience trouble. You're going to experience trials. You're going to experience sorrow. Following me will be a difficult path to walk. And if you read through the book of Acts, you'll see this prediction comes true. They faced horrible religious persecution. And history tells us 10 of the 11 guys died as martyrs. So they were put to death for following Jesus. So suffice to say, you know, if you're a Christ follower, it doesn't always go easy for you. True back then. It's true even today. Listen, beloved, anytime you draw a line in the sand, somebody's going to be on the other side of that line. You understand that? And Jesus didn't always draw lines. He sometimes drew circles around people, cut them a lot of slack. But other times, boy, he said, this is right, that is wrong. And we're called to do the same thing. Sometimes we draw circles around people. But sometimes we say, you know, listen, uh, there are some things that are moral and there are some things that are immoral. And if you draw any lines in the sand, just be sure. You, you, draw, you draw a line in the sand about gender. You draw a line in the sand about social injustice or about racial inequality. You draw a line in the sand and say, that's greed. About the rights of the unborn. There's going to be somebody on the other side of it. And he's just warning the guys here. It's true back then. It's true today. You really want to follow Jesus? It's going to cost you something. You'll experience some hardships and sorrows along the way. So don't be surprised. Don't be surprised at all. And during those times of trouble, of sorrow, of tribulation, Jesus says, verse 33, take courage. Be confident, if you will. Don't let the tribulations that are brought against you take the heart of you. Don't, don't let it rob you of your heart. Don't, don't let it overwhelm you like something. This, over, I can't do I, Take courage and see why. Verse 33, because I have overcome the world. And it's that little statement that I think summarizes our Lord's teaching in chapters 13 through 16. He said, I've overcome the world. Uh, the Greek verb nikao, the noun form is nike, from which we get the English athletic brand Nike. It means to conquer. It means to have victory over. And uh, uh, the reason why you and I and we who believe in the Lord Jesus, are you a believer in the Lord Jesus? Say amen. 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 If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, you can take heart. You can experience peace in the midst of all those troubles and sorrows and hardships that come in life because Jesus is the world's overcomer. He overcame sin and its penalty. He overcame death and the grave. He overcame Satan and darkness. He overcame the world and all persecution. The death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus back to heaven, that series of event is the ultimate game changer because it changes everything. He says, I am the over." Comer. And he puts it in the, in the tense in the Greek grammar that emphasized, I, I conquered in the past, 
I promise you, I am conquering right now, and I assure you, I will conquer for all eternity. So suffice to say, in this whole teaching here, the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension is the ultimate, because it changes everything for you, for me, for us, or for anyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the primary lesson that we're going to get during our time together. The whole focal point of what Jesus is saying to the guys and saying to you and me and us is this. Because I've overcome, you'll overcome too. You see, the minute that you believed in the Lord Jesus, everything he earned is given to you. His victory over death is your victory over death. His victory over the grave is your victory over the, over the grave. Do you understand that? Have any of you buried loved ones and you stood over a grave and your heart just broke? We've all gone through that. Just know someday you will see her or him again because Jesus conquered, you're going to conquer too. Over sin's penalty, over all of the despair and hopelessness of this world, see? Because you are completely identified with Christ. And you get to share in everything that he earned. You don't have to earn it. He's earned it for you. And that's why the scriptures say time and again, Romans 8, 17, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So everything he gets, you get. And that's the reason why you and we, and uh, you and I, we have hope in the midst of all the difficulties that we face here. When God looked down and saw Jesus on the cross, he saw you on the cross. And when God looks down and sees you, he sees Jesus' perfection being given to you. And that's why the, uh, those of us who believe, I'll say it again, if you believed on the Lord Jesus, then you're an overcomer. The, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world. Not our efforts, not our good works, not our being good people, not living a good Christian life. It's believing in him because he's victorious. We're victorious here. Say, His righteousness is your righteousness. His treasure is is your treasure. See? And that's why we sing our songs. We say, thanks be to God through who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we lift him up. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. And everywhere we go, we're just lifting him up because he's overcome. We will overcome. And it's all because he loves you. All because he loves you. That's why he went to the cross here. Okay? Now, did you come to hear from the Lord this morning? All right, when you leave here and somebody says, well, what, what was the main idea of church today? It's simply this. Because he's victorious, I'm victorious. Say it with me. Because he's victorious, I'm victorious. That's the message. I want you to today... I want you to rest in that. Just rest in it. He's done enough. He's done everything. He's changed everything. You don't have to work to earn his forgiveness. He's already forgiven you. He's already loved you. He, he's given you everything. So just rest in it. Praise the Lord. Rejoice in it. I'm going to heaven. Are you going to heaven? Come on, brethren. Are, are we going to heaven? Yeah, we're going to heaven. So celebrate it. But today and this week, whether you have a great up week or a totally down week, whether you're on top of the pile or the pile's on top of you, you've got Jesus and Jesus is enough because he's the overcomer. You're going to overcome. Somebody say praise the Lord, will you? Okay, see, that's what this is all about. And that's what this text is all about. The guys, their hearts are broken. And he says, I got you. I got you. I'm enough. 
So that's the big idea. Now, what does that mean for you and me and us this week? Uh, we're going to go back now and go through the text and see four things. Because Jesus won the victory, first, it answers our wonderings about the future. We all have questions, so did the original guys. Verse 16, let's pull our text apart now. Uh, Jesus says, a little while and you will no longer see me. So within 12 hours, he would be dead and buried. They wouldn't see him anymore. But then he adds, verse 16, and again, a little while, you will see me. And they started scratching their heads. What are you talking about? Verse 17, some of the disciples then said to one another, what's this thing he's telling us? A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while you will see me. And because I go to the Father. So they were saying, what is this that he says? A little while. We do not know what he is talking about. Any of you have any questions about the future? About the plan of God? About why he lets certain things happen? Why you get sick? Why you bury a spouse? Why you go through? Why you win the lottery? Why you don't win the lottery? We all have these questions about the future. And in the context, the guys, they, their confusion came from their expectations. They were absolutely convinced that Jesus was going to start his earthly rule over the kingdom of God. They were absolutely convinced that's what he was going to do. So when he starts talking about dying, they go, what are you talking about? And he starts saying, I've got to leave you guys and go back to heaven. They go, why are you going anywhere? You're going to start your kingdom here on earth. Why are you, why are you talking about leave? They just didn't get it. And neither do we here. All we know is this. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. People ask me, you know, when is Jesus going to come back? I have no idea. Nobody does. What we're told is simply this, is that all of human history is moving towards one goal. History is not just a random succession of events that are not tied to each other. They all have an ultimate purpose. And that ultimate purpose and the end of all of human history will come with the exalting of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's God's plan, and that's what's going to happen. Paul was absolutely clear in Ephesians chapter 1. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. Here it is. At the right time, God the Father will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and everything on earth. What's going to happen to America? I have no idea. I, I, we'll see. All I know is Jesus' full assurance will see him again. And that everything is moving towards this pinnacle. And the point that I would make with you, the big idea here, because he overcomes, you're going to overcome. And the day is coming when he will rule over heaven and earth. And guess who's going to rule with him? Because he conquers, I conquer. Because he rules, I've asked to be mayor of Maui. That position has been taken, okay? I might get dog catcher in El Cajon, but... See, it changes everything. You wonder about the future. You wonder where everything is going. The world just seems like it's crazy. In the world, you have tribulation. But take courage. Don't, don't let this pull the heart out of you. God is in control. He's overcome. 
It's the ultimate game changer. And because he rules, we will rule, rule too. So somebody say, praise the Lord, will you? This changes our whole perspective of the future. Secondly, it demonstrates how earthly suffering is temporary. Verse 19, Jesus knew that they wished to question him, and he said to them, Are you deliberating together about this, that I said a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament. He doesn't answer their question about the little while statement. Instead, he focuses in on their heart's pain, their mourning, their grief over his coming death over their disappointment, their dream that the kingdom of God was going to come upon the earth. They're, they're just heartbroken here. Jesus says, not everybody will be sad at that, though. Verse 20, but the world will rejoice. Uh, Pilate, uh, the religious leaders of the day, when Jesus died, they all thought good riddance. We're done with this guy. Listen, on Good Friday, the devil was dancing a jig. He thought he had won the battle. Man, he was thrilled that Jesus was dead. Not these guys. Verse 20, you will grieve. But then he makes this promise. But your grief will be turned into joy. What's he saying? The very event that's going to cause you all the heartache, I promise you, one day will be something that you rejoice in. See what he's saying? I'm going to the cross, and the cross is going to break your heart. But I promise you the day will come when you will rejoice in that cross as the thing that brought you eternal salvation. The pain will become joyful. It's a very, very deep thought. We, we've got crosses all over the place here. You know, you know it's an instrument of death, don't you? And yet, it's our boast, Paul says. We take our greatest pride in, in that cross, in that instrument of execution. Why? Because it's the thing that brought us eternal salvation, see? On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, you know it? The emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of loss sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. The pain will become a joy. What are, you, what are you going through right now? A heartache? In the world you have tribulation, okay? Welcome to the club. We cry, we weep, we get angry, we get frustrated, we don't know what to do, we get depressed, we get overwhelmed, just like everybody else does. He says, in the world you're going to have tribulation, but take courage. Don't let it just suck the heart out of you. That's what life is down here. You just take courage because I succeeded, you're going to succeed too. All of that pain, I promise you, one day, will be turned into joy. I promise you. 
my biggest problem with it is that I, I don't always believe it. Kind of hard sometimes, isn't it? Um, those of you who are in high school still, I promise you, high school does not last forever. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord, will you? Amen. High school does not last forever. Joy will come. And we just have to believe it. Lots of verses. Peter says, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, he's going to use that suffering to perfect you, confirm you, strengthen, and establish you. For a little while. And it's going to hurt. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. But I promise you, the very thing that's causing you the pain will bring you great rejoicing in the future. And Jesus illustrates it using childbirth. Verse 21. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. What causes the pain of childbirth? The child. What causes the joy of childbirth? The child. And that's what he'll do with all of our pain and sorrow. Right now we cry. So we don't put band-aids on, on hurts. We don't say, oh, come on, that, that shouldn't hurt you so badly. We, down here you're going to have tribulation. It's going to hurt and we cry and we weep and we hold each other. That's why we need, must be in community. So somebody can kind of put their arms around us. And at the same point in time, they can encourage us. Listen, weeping may last for the night, but there will be a shout of joy in the morning. His promise, verse 22, therefore you too have grief now, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. He conquers, you conquer. You see that? And because of it, we know that the cross did not last forever. But it came with resurrection, and the pain ended. See? And the same thing will be true for us. And this is what the Apostle Paul lived by. He said, for momentary light affliction. And man, he got beat up badly. Momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. You have no idea how great that joy is going to be when you see the Lord face to face. It might come in this life. For most of us, it's going to come when we go and see the Lord face to face. Can't even begin to describe it. While well, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Did you come to hear from the Lord this morning? Yes. What's the big message? Because he overcomes, I overcome. That's the big message. It helps us as we look to the future. It assures us that the pains of this life do not last forever. Thirdly, it assures us that God hears and answers our prayer. Verse 23, and that day you will not question me or ask me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. The Father heard Jesus' prayer. The Father answered Jesus' prayer. The Father hears your prayer. The Father will answer your prayers. So don't hold back. What are you holding back for? Ask him anything. And the whole key is to ask in Jesus' name, not just a ritualistic little, you know, phrase that we tack on. It's essentially saying, ask for the same stuff that Jesus would ask for. I tend to ask that life might be comfortable for me.
what I really need to ask for is, Lord, honor yourself and honor the Father through this and accomplish your perfect plan, whatever that is. Boy, we come that way. You can be sure God's going to answer your prayer. Until now, verse 24, you've asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be made full. And in that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say that I will request of the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you. You understand that? The Father loves you and you and you and you, and there's nothing you can do to make him love you more. He already loves you. So he says, come and ask. That's what he said. Your prayer is a delight to him. So what are you holding back? Say. He conquers, we conquer. His suffering ends, our suffering will end. His prayers were answered, our prayers were answered. It helps us focus on his provision and not on our failure. Verse 28, let me just wrap this up. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I'm leaving the world again and going to the Father. Death, burial, resurrection, ascension back to glory. They finally start to get it. Verse 29, his disciples said, Lo, now you're speaking plainly and are not using a figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and you have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. They're saying, Lord, we know your word can be trusted. But that faith that they had in him would be seriously tested in just a few hours. Verse 31, Jesus answered, Do you now believe? You say you believe. Really? Easy to believe with 11 other believers around you in a church. Yeah, I believe. It's a whole other thing when the enemy is all around you in the Garden of Gethsemane. Verse 32, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered each to his own home and to leave me alone. What was he saying? You guys are going to fail miserably. Your faith is going to be shaken. I ask you to pray, you're going to fall asleep. You have an opportunity to stand with me against the betrayal and you all just run away because you don't want to get arrested either. And you just take off. And just in a few short hours, Peter would, he'd curse. I don't even know the guy. Horrible failures. Who hasn't? Verse 33, these things I've spoken to you so that you may have peace. I know you're going to fail. That's why he was going to the cross. See, I'm not doing this. I'm not saying any of this to shame you. I'm not saying any to condemn any of you. I'm saying it because it's true. I want you to have peace. In this world, you're going to have trouble. You're going to succeed in certain things, and you're going to fail at certain things. And there's just something about humanity that loves to focus on our failures. He just says, it's coming. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. But don't let it suck the heart out of you when you fail. Why? Verse 33, because I've overcome the world. He succeeds, we succeed. His perfect life is shared with you. You come to hear from the Lord this morning? His success is your success. 
His victory is your victory. His conquering is your conquering. We can rest in it, we can rejoice in it, and we can celebrate it. Because it's going to help us as we look to the future. It's going to help us when we're going through suffering. It's going to help us when we feel like praying won't even change anything. It'll help us when we stumble and we fall this week. We're going to just keep our eyes on him because he's in the business of transformation and he transforms that sorrow and the experiences of life to become something really precious in his sight. His victory is our victory. Isn't that the real question? Well, I trust him today. Or will the uncertainty of the future overwhelm me? Will the suffering of this life paralyze me? Will unanswered prayer bind up my heart where I don't even want to ask him or I don't even want to hope that things could be different when my own failure comes back and that inner critic inside of me says you're a, just a miserable failure I'm just going to keep looking to him I'm not enough he's enough say that with me Somebody praise the Lord. You got time for one story? A little granddaughter, four years old, playing at my house. Grandpa's house has a lot of wood around it. I like to build things. And uh, she got a pretty big splinter in her hand. And I'm sure it hurt, but uh, four-year-old girls can wail like nobody else. Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, she just goes off, and it's like I, you know, had murdered her. And so uh, my first reaction to it all is to leave and go out in the garage and just can't get away from it. Uh, and then I thought, no, I can't do that. Um, I'm going to go get her a lollipop, and I'm going to distract her. And I just want to stop the crying. That's all I want to do. I just d- distract her. And my daughter, her mom, comes out, and she goes, I don't think we're going to do that, Dad. And she instead takes my granddaughter's hand and looks at it. Oh, sweetie. Yep, that, that's going to have to come out because that's going to hurt you down the road. We don't deal with this. we we, we got to do this. And so she starts wailing even more. So my daughter, being wise, she says, okay, come on with me. And she goes and gets a little needle, you know, a little sewing needle, and kind of cleans it off with some of that, what do they call that stuff, that you clean stuff, hydrogen peroxide, whatever it is. And she hands the needle to um, Joelle, to her daughter, and then she puts her own hand out there and says, I want you to kind of pick at my hand and see what this is going to feel like. And so my granddaughter, she starts picking at Courtney's hand. And she said, that's what I'm going to do to you. You can go ahead and try it a little bit more. And she said, it's going to hurt. But you have to trust mommy on this one. It will be better for you in the long run to get that splinter out. What did Jesus do? I had a splinter. Really big splinter. And I had a bunch of them. We'll just call it sin. And I was wailing. And you know what he did? He put out his hand. And the nail went through his hand first. And he went on that cross so that my splinters 
and your splinters could all be pulled out and it's better for us in the long run. That's why we're here. That's why we are followers of Jesus of Nazareth. Because he conquered, we conquer. Because he pulled out the splinters, we are now splinterless. And we are healed. And someday, someday, it'll be full and complete. Somebody say praise the Lord, will you? Okay. All right, let's bow our heads. Uh, You've been patient with me. All right, everybody take a really deep breath, will you? Anybody, for the first time this morning, Jesus, I'm sorry. I need forgiveness for my sins. I want you as my Savior. I believe your death, burial, you rose from the dead. You're alive today, and I want you as my Savior. I want to follow you as my Lord. Anybody? Come into my heart, Lord. Be the basis of my life, Lord. Oh, that's your prayer. And then for any who are wondering about the future, who are struggling with the pain, who are hopeless about answer prayer, who see your failures, Look again to the cross, but look beyond the cross to the empty grave and to the throne above. He's won the battle for you, so rejoice.